Hi, thank you. Um, some of you already know me from uh, previous years. Uh, this time I didn't have to come very far. Currently I'm uh, living in Cambridge. So if some of you are here in the UK or wanna have a little nice trip, and maybe want to hang a bit, uh, give, drop me a line. I mean, to be cool to do some D stuff or other cool projects. Uh, maybe I can provide a, even a place to stay for a few days or something like that. Okay, so today I'm going to be talk about going to be talking about compile time in D in general and how, in my opinion, it could be improved in some ways. And I think uh, compile time times could be perhaps be a solution for some of those areas for for improvement. And this is still um, a very, very early uh, concept. So I, I'm prototyping some of these ideas, but I felt like perhaps it would be worth to present uh, my initial direction. Uh, I felt like you could give me some feedback on this, uh, but they are very speculative ideas. Uh, still, it was kind of to borrow line from Linus in the spirit of uh, present early, present often kind of thing. So. Um, I really expect you to be very skeptical of what I'm about to present today. So it's me, it's not you. Your sanity uh, is still there. But uh, even though I expect heavy feedback, if you uh, want to provide feedback and ideas and different approaches, uh, that would be very welcome. So what's the issue? Um, have you heard about the Peter principle? <laughs> yeah, quite a few of you. The idea is that uh, in an organization, you are promoted until you reach your level of incompetence. And this is a management concept, right, where you're like this really good employee and you're doing good work. It's like, yeah, let's promote you. And you keep doing good work and yeah, yeah, let's keep promoting you. And then suddenly you're in some kind of management position, don't really know what you're doing. And, and now you're stuck there because you're not going to be promoted, you're not going to be uh, down motor or whatever it's called. Uh, so it used to be such this nice and productive employee and now you're stuck doing something you don't like and nobody likes what you're doing. And this is kind of a metaphor that can be applied to a lot of things in life and maybe even something like D. So um, D was introduced as kind of this alternative to C and uh, let's do kind of like a little thought experiment here. I want you to picture like a typical C code base and it's a pretty reasonable language, despite its flaws. I mean, some parts of it are pretty okay. The basic stuff like uh, functions, structs, things like that. So there are some problems like with the types, undefined behavior and so on, but the, the basics are pretty reasonable. Certainly could, could be improved and D improves on a lot of them, but uh, it's pretty okay. But then there are other parts of C that are like a complete train wreck. And I just focus here on the preprocessor because it's like, I really hate it. Like headers, including them, there are the, the dependencies, all of their effects, having to define concepts as like preprocessor defines and macros. It's like, man, that's like the worst idea ever. All of the problems that come with it, not respecting scoping, the unsafety of the lack of having to put parentheses in, uh, around stuff. It's like completely brain dead. And when you use D as an uh, alternative to that kind of C-like programming, where you use like C-style C code, uh, it's really nice because you take all of the bad parts, like uh, you had to define constants, now you use like enum constants, you, you add like these ugly macros, you replace them with functions that can be inline, can be templates, so on. We have all of these nice modules. And uh, it's really, really nice. I had these two disparate languages, the C preprocessor and the C language itself. You replace it with a much more cohesive whole. And uh, the experience is, well, this meme, in my opinion, it was invented to describe the experience of programming in D in a C-like fashion. Sure, sometimes you'll have like vulnerabilities and so on, but it's, it's just so, so, so pleasant to like, you hit enter, 100,000 lines of code get compiled in one second, and it, things just work, they are super simple because you write very straightforward codes, it compiles super fast, you don't really use these very advanced concepts, so even a beginner can understand the code base. Uh, if you really have hard problems, you can just use a more, few of the more advanced features here and there. It's really, really nice. And uh, I think sometimes it's nice to like 
just do that, that little experiment and do that kind of programming just to see the other side of life. But I, I feel it's really pleasant. Anyway, so if this is so good, and this is like, uh, oh, the good old times. You're like, what do you mean good old times? It's like before we had anesthesia. Yeah, don't, don't think about it too hard. <laughs> see, if this is so good, then why rock the boat? It's because you don't really want to program in C because you want these really nice features like ranges and introspection, generic algorithms, safety, no GC, immutable traits, all of this nice stuff. The problem is that sometimes uh, that doesn't really work that well. And, and let me just um, clarify here. I imagine that I'd be presenting like to a very decentric audience, but I know some of you guys here uh, don't have too much experience with E. So this is all very relative. I mean, D on its worst day, it's still better than Java and that nonsense. So that's very relative. But uh, you know, there are some problems. When you use some D features, the compilation can get really slow. You get these annoying error messages that are hard to understand. Sometimes you change one part of your program and something seemingly completely unrelated breaks the other sides. Uh, you have these weird features that you're not really sure how they should work and how they should interact with other features. And uh, it's an experience that uh, may not be the most pleasant. And that's like, well, yeah, D has been promoted to its level of incompetence. You were so happy using all of the basic features and they work really well because there were this improvement upon C, like all of the bad stuff had been removed and replaced with something better. But you, you, you just had to open the box and you just had to use all of the new features. But then you get stuck with some of these less well-defined uh, behaviors and these not as pleasant uh, programming experience. So why has this happened? Well, there's not one straightforward answer, but uh, I think part of the problem in a, is that D just has amassed a lot of features. And um, there's a lot of terrain to cover. Not all of the features interact with each other as well as they should. Not all of them are as well specified and implemented as they should. And there's always a lot of things to do into improving the language. And even features which sometimes in, in a fundamental way are just dealing with the same underlying concepts. They deal with them in different ways, so they kind of clash with each other. They have like different perspectives on how things should behave. Also, another thing that I believe sometimes happens is that when you program in this more modern D style, uh, the way the D language works and the kind of uh, approach we're trying to take, I feel that D as it's currently fine may not, may not be like, have the most appropriate programming model for how we want to program. And what I mean here is that, um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. So I have this feeling that, uh, like Struthrup, he said, like in C++, is this, there is this small, elegant language struggling to get out. So I ask you, is there like a more elegant language trying to come out of D, like this very uh, beautiful core. Um, and I believe there is, uh, although in this talk, I will focus more spe specifically on the compile time features. So how do we get to that uh, m essential core of the D language? I think there are uh, two major ways of improving D. Uh, one of them is the way that's done most of the time and it's a completely valid path where it's this iterative model, uh, just pick parts of the language that could be improved in some way, uh, don't have all of the nice properties that they should have, and you iterate on it, you provide a compatibility path so that you can keep using the, the old approach, you transition to the new approach, and here we have uh, things like uh, constructors, which you've seen talked about yesterday, things like the proto-object uh, uh, efforts, I think it's also a very nice uh, uh, work that's being done there. I think th this is great, um, but for some of the more fundamental issues like this big language, uh, maybe this isn't quite the right model for what we want to do. Uh, this may not be the most appropriate approach. And I, I believe the part here is that this is a really big language, but we don't have like a huge community. So it's not like we can unleash this uh, legion of uh, 
programmers and go like to these committees specify all the intricacies <coughs> of the language like uh, C++ does, like all of these proposals, uh, and they battle it out and then comes like a thousand page PDF uh, that really specifies all of the different current cases. I think uh, our long-term long strategy must be in terms of simplifying the language and finding common core features that we can build the other things upon. And uh, so this is more like a research project and I, I mean here research not necessarily in a sense of academic, but uh, that uh, my idea is that sometimes it's worth the, the effort to like do a little pause, think th things from scratch, like not be necessarily uh, concerned about compatibility in the long term, just explore an idea like if there were no compatibility uh, objections, how would we really want to do this? And then once you, you, you explore that without having some kind of blinders on, you think, okay, I see here what's really fundamental. How can I then backport to the current production team? All right, so um, what should the core D features be? I think modern D revolves around a lot of compile time, and this is mostly two aspects. It's the introspection part, where you look at the code that's around you, and you see what its properties are, and based on what you see, then you do code generation. So this is a bit like uh, object-oriented frameworks in the sense that you're no longer in control of like the, the main function. You generate code that will interact with this ecosystem. And uh, you do something very similar, but like at compile time. And I feel it's very important that these kinds of activities, since they are so central to modern D, they should be very natural. They should feel like just regular programming for like runtime stuff. They should be very accessible to beginners <coughs> and so on. So, What's this compile time? Uh, well, it's not a single thing. I mean, there's a lot of different uses that we have for it. Some of them are computing stuff at compile time, so we don't have to compute it at runtime. Others are like metaprogramming, generating other programs, just choosing which parts of the program we are, we are going to compile, which flags, things like that. And so we have very different uses for it, but in terms of also the implementation, uh, in, they have very different implementations. And this often leads to a lot of accidental complexity where the different parts, they don't really agree on a common model. There's this interesting article online on the D wiki talking about uh, compile time versus compile time because especially new programmers indeed tend to have this idea of what compile time is that's not quite correct. And, uh, you can see that indeed there are two fundamental compile time notions. There's a notion of the AST building level, which is like kind of the, the templates, the stack tick, if, and that kind of stuff. And then there's the compile time function execution. Um, and the problem is that they are kind of disconnected and sometimes people don't really realize that, which is uh, something that this article addresses. You should totally read it. So the AST manipulation doesn't really have access to the complete semantics of the program, while the compile time function evaluation doesn't really have access to the ST manipulation. So they exist in completely different worlds, which explains why people will sometimes ask things like, why can't the compiler read this value at compile time since it's clearly known at compile time value? So for instance, here we have this compile time function and we have a static if, and we are looking at this B parameter and um, we know that this B is true because uh, there's this true value specified there at compile time, but this won't work, of course. And if you're familiar with the intricacies of these languages, it will be like totally obvious to you and you're like, why is this even an issue? But uh, the, the problem is that there's no clear mental model for someone who's just coming to this stuff. Uh, and it's very easy to, if you're already very familiar with D, to disregard this and think that that's not an issue at all. But I believe it is. I believe uh, there's something fundamental here which is being confused. And there are sometimes examples which trip up even uh, more experienced programmers. Like in this example, we have a function which receives this um, array of arguments and you do a for each over them, you do a static if, and then you have the continue for the for each. And so you're thinking, ah, what does this print? All the times and not an integer time. 
what what does it print? Sorry. Like not an int at every iteration. It prints not an int on every iteration. Yeah, and when it is an int, it also prints that this is an int. Right, and this isn't super obvious to someone uh, who's not. Uh, doesn't have a lot of the, the experience. So read the article if you don't understand why this is the case. Moving on to a different example, this should also be pretty easy to someone who just got started with you. So what does this print? Int. int. int okay. Int, int function of int. It's pretty easy. What does it print now? Well, I thought Attila would know this. Be like, ah, this is super trivial. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, it, it's not a, it's not a function anymore. So it prints voids, which I'm not even sure makes sense, <laughs> because it's like void is a type. A template doesn't have a type, so it should just not print anything or give out an error. Being strictly speaking correct about types, like type theory and that kind of stuff. So why does it print void? Well, because that part of the compiler doesn't know anything about templates. It doesn't see templates. Um, but I think this is problematic because it's totally reasonable uh, to think what it, the type of a template is. There is nothing fundamental about this issue, decision of that part of the compiler not knowing about templates. Uh, so perhaps this is the design that we actually want. So, What's a type? A type says useful things about uh, our programs. It says what something represents, what its possible states are, and what operations you can do with it. So I ask you, is this something reasonable to ask about a template? No. No? It has no type. The question doesn't make sense. It has no type, but couldn't it have a type? <laughs> So the argument is, it has no, no state, it has no, no operations that you can do with it. But, well, I disagree. I think it has operations like you can instantiate. That's an operation. You, the type can tell to you what you need to instantiate it with. The type can tell you what do you get back because different templates return different things. Yeah. But like a simple template with... Um, For like simple implied templates, like a class or a struct or a function, this what you're saying makes sense. But a template can also be like a block, and you can define many things inside of it. Um, maybe I'm just not seeing what you're saying. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the summary of the question is like, well, this is a really hard, tough issue because it's like a template could just return so many different things. It could be like a struct, but it could also be like a block, right? So how do you make sense of that? Well, that's why I say that this is very out there. It's like smoking a bit of weed thinking, where, what's really fundamental about this? But uh, on the other hand, there's like so much potential. Maybe if we can answer some of these questions, then we can unleash all of these different potential that's there in the language. Well, it's not really a I understand what you're saying, but templates aren't types. They're kinds, though. I mean, the, your example with foo was kind um, type to type. It takes a type and then it returns another type, which is a function. So Attila basically is saying, ah, oh, you can't do it because it's, well, it's, I guess it's a function. Well, a function has a type, so I guess it kind of well, makes it's sense. Order. It's yeah. a higher order type. So, yes. Ah, so it's kind of a type, it's a different kind of type. Yes. It's a type of types. <laughs> it's a type of types. So higher order type, uh, kind of function. So it turns out well, it's like, ah, it doesn't make any sense, you start. But then you're like, well, could be these, it could be that. Well, maybe it's worth thinking about it. So I could go, could, could go away to right now. It's like success. I've got you started thinking about this. Uh, we already have some success. So uh, still being on the, um, wondering about the, these characteristics of uh, templates, uh, we have discussed what its type should be, although we haven't arrived at the conclusion yet. We, should, we can also wonder what exactly the semantics should be. And these are these areas of the language that aren't quite very well specified. So for instance, there are issues of uh, 
when exactly is the template specified, so issues of ordering, because a lot of the language uh, is declarative, but then you, uh, you instantiate templates in those declarative contexts. So <laughs> what happens uh, when you have uh, things that uh, will be, uh, you will be able to notice? Uh, yeah? When I was thinking of templates, I was thinking a little bit of like JavaScript closures. So if mm -hmm. you have a template and define like three functions and a struct inside, in some ways a template is kind of like a compile time environment in which you can define other things inside like types. And you can have like a chain of nested environments that fully describe the type. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I could see that. So it's a kind of compile time environment, something where at compile time you do stuff, and yeah, I think I could work with that. We'll get to that. If I don't address your issue, then please ask me again. Uh, I'll try to understand it better. So uh, in cases where there will be side effects, we'll have to really be mindful of uh, uh, what the semantics of the ordering are. And also uh, in, times, in terms of uh, how many times a template is instantiated, <coughs> Uh, what are the semantics that you want to be there? Not what currently are in D, but in general, like the best possible world, D was designed from scratch with the best possible design. What would we really want it to be? And currently we have this cookie cutter model where it's like this, uh, I don't know, this kind of uh, cookie uh, shape, and then we create it several times. And this isn't really uh, always the most appropriate model. And you can see, for instance, these uh, with the type def template, where you have to pass this cookie parameter. And this is kind of a hack, because it's like, uh, we say that uh, if you instantiate a template uh, multiple times with the same parameters, you will get back always the same type. But then in our time, it's like, well, that's not really what I want. So I'll just pass another fake parameter just to disambiguate and say that I got back different types. But maybe that could be an opportunity to revisit is this actually the semantics that we want from templates. Maybe we want to sometimes get different times even though we pass uh, the same arguments. Back there. Um, I have worked with this problem a lot and the thing is, templates do pretty much have to stay the way they are, but we could introduce another system that has more functionality that you want, that allows you to specify what kinds, what types of type operations you can perform and stuff. Mm. Okay, that, that sounds, let's talk about that. That sounds interesting. <laughs> okay, so, what about the semantics of what you get back? I mean, hmm. you have, in a template, you generate stuff, like you don't return a value, right? But we often use templates to basically get a value back. So we want function like call and return. And so we have this so-called eponymous trip where you assign uh, a member of the template, the name of the template, but it, this, is, this is just a symptom of the, the model just being broken in some way that doesn't really do what we want. So we got this kind of workaround, but uh, we got so used to it, but we kind of forget this kind of, in a, in a sense, ugly and uh, very arbitrary. And it's interesting because uh, this reminds me of another language where you assign something to the name of the function to set the return value, you know what that language is? Basic, right, yeah, things like Visual Basic, things like that. And uh, that's generally not considered to be like a super popular design decision, but we have basically the same thing here, right? Uh, and then every time we do one of these decisions, like, oh, it's really cool, we don't want to actually access a member of the template, we actually want to get just like the return value of the template. Uh, so we'll introduce this trick of the, of the eponymous uh, naming the member after the type, and that will totally work and solve the issue. But then we introduce all these complexities such as, well, what about the other members? Should they stay hidden, or do you want them to keep, be, still be publicly accessible so that maybe they, that's useful in other types? So it's like, oh, well, I guess uh, it's useful in some contexts. 
Uh, in other contexts, it's not useful. I don't really know. We punt on these decisions, and all of these garbage tends to accumulate. And they're not very significant by themselves. But then they all start interacting with each other and have this big ball of mud. So that's why I think that there's a, it's important to really reevaluate these decisions. And there's other parts where the, the language interacts. So for instance, if we have a regular function, Bas, uh, we can just call it Bas, and we'll be implicitly calling it. But then with templates, even though they basically have the same model of the, you're just calling it, getting the value, you still have to, even if it doesn't have any, any arguments, you still have to put the, uh, what, what's it called that? Uh, bang. bang and the uh, parentheses. So this is completely arbitrary. I'm sure there's a good reason for the way that the, like the parse and things work currently, but fundamental, these kinds of decisions are arbitrary. And, and all of this complexity tends to accumulate and it trips up beginners and interacts in bad ways. Then there's, uh, in terms still of thinking about what compile time means, there's CTFE. Who here knows what CTFE means? What does it mean? Come on, it's easy. Well, execute an expression at compile time by compiling its pieces if they are missing. Yeah, yeah, and what does the acronym mean? Compile time function execution. Everybody agrees with that? I don't know. Half of the times it says compile time function evaluation. And I've seen lots of people argument that it should be evaluation because it's just a generalization of uh, a constant folding and so on. And while the, the official spec says it's compile time function execution, but you'll see all of these uh, different, uh, different nomenclature everywhere. So you can't even agree on what some of the most basilar fundamental building blocks of modern D are called. I agree with you, it should be called uh, compile time execution. I, I don't think we even have to focus on the function because in some contexts you don't have to involve functions. There's also the issue of what should be a CTF feeable, what should be executable at compile time. And I don't think currently there's really a good specification level uh, rule for that, something that uh, very clearly defines that. Uh, but this should be something where if I ask you, there should be like, oh, it's Totally, there's that rule, and I know if I apply that rule, uh, I'll be able to answer that. I don't think that exists at the moment, so that's another area for improvement. So once we have all of these different differences, uh, they tend to compound. Uh, so one thing that I really like uh, about uh, the more modern versions of the modern, I'm uh, talking about like last quite a few years, I compare like D1 and the early versions, uh, is we have this unified function calling syntax where we can replace uh, these very inconvenient chains uh, of uh, function and algorithms executions with this uh, flow that much more clearly represents how the data is being transformed step by step. Uh, so you transform from the top there syntax to the bottom one. But then of course, uh, this doesn't really work with templates. Uh, Attila has this interesting article about uh, what he got wrong. He has some examples there about uh, some ways where you would want to use this with templates, but uh, UFC doesn't really work there. You can look at the article to look at it into more detail, but uh, basically this is kind of like what you have to write, and this is what you would like to write instead using the UFC syntax. <laughs> And uh, this, in this example, you still have to like uh, factor out like uh, these functions that you're calling at compile time. But uh, actually, I argue that uh, we should also, for instance, be able to use uh, lambdas with templates. And so, this is just another example of all of these arbitrary difference because uh, some things are uh, work with regular code, some things uh, don't work with templates. We all we have these two separate universes inside of them. Another example would be function arguments, where you want to pass a function to another function, like first order functions, uh, first class functions. And if you are passing like a, at a function at runtime, you have to use the ampersand syntax, while if you are passing it to a template, you don't have to use it. 
And then, of course, these will compound with things like uh, if then you specify, oh, it'd be great to have like a property-like behavior where you don't actually need to put the parentheses to call it. Uh, then suddenly, this works with one of the syntaxes, doesn't work with the other, and so on. I believe that one of the strengths of the uh, is its plasticity. It depends a bit on how you use it. But for instance, here in this example, I have defined a struct foo, and uh, I'm accessing uh, a member of foo, x. So I write f dot x. But then suddenly it's like, oh, I, do, I don't really want uh, the value of x. I want something a bit different. So I want to create this kind of uh, indirection layer. But uh, maybe I just want to prototype some idea really quickly. So I don't want to be having to change f dot x everywhere. And this is the kind of change that are really easy to do with E because you, like, you just hide the original x and uh, you introduce these member uh, x uh, methods and you still just call it f dot x and now it calls the function instead of directly accessing the member. And uh, so it's super plastic D. Uh, this is really convenient being able to do these changes. You can quickly prototype a lot of changes without a lot of trouble. But then, of course, it's just one of those examples where this doesn't really work uh, with, with templates. Uh, let me see the slides here. So. <coughs> I think I got, got a problem here with my slides. Anyway, uh, here in this example, uh, I'm passing um, two runtime variables to a function. And uh, suddenly, I decide I want to change uh, one of those variables. So instead of being a, a runtime value, just being a compile time value. So I change the y from being an int to being an enum. And suddenly, I on my call side to the foo function, where I always would just uh, I call it x uh, colon y, now I have to pass it with uh, the compile time arguments and the runtime arguments, at least if I want to preserve the compile timeness of the member y. And in some cases, you, you do want to do that. Uh, so unlike the previous example, where we were able to uh, do this transformation without really affecting the rest of the code base. Here, if I wanted to preserve this compile timeness, we have to change the call sites. And this is an issue that does arrive in practice uh, as being problematic. And I found it interesting that uh, this was one case where maybe not C the language, but at least GCC was actually better than D. Uh, in, in GCC, you have this magic called built-in constant P. So for instance, here I have this function, uh, this C function bar, which it takes a runtime argument, x. But I can, even though it's not declared as like a compile time uh, variable, I can actually ask the compiler, do you really know what the value of this x is going to be? And based on that, I can actually make some different decisions. And this is just a nonsensical example that I came up. So it's like, this is, it's not supposed to, to make a lot of sense examples. So you're like, What's the point of this? Uh, how would this be useful in any way? Uh, the example where I found this in the real world uh, is for an SDK of a, a chip where you wanted to write some control reg register of that chip and you just wanted to write uh, in your code, write to that control register, that specific register, this value. And this was um, a preprocessor macro where it asks, well, if I know the, the value at compile time, then I can use uh, a, the good encoding of the CSR instruction where I encode the immediate inside the instruction itself. And if I don't know it, then I'll just have to pass it on a register. So you are able to optimize your code based on asking the compiler, do I actually know at compile time what this value is going to be, even though I'm using a syntax which it looks like this is just a regular uh, runtime argument. Um, and that, that's kind of the point. It's like for users, this just looks like a regular function, so they don't have to think about all of this magic. But it's also that it interacts well with your environment. Because if suddenly uh, that 7 was coming from some other header, and it turns out it's no longer uh, 
something that's defined at compile time, you don't have to change the function between, uh, oh, write the CSR with some value I know at compile time or write the CSR with some value that I don't know at uh, compile time. So you automatically get the, the best behavior uh, based on what parameter you're actually um, passing it to. You could also see these with examples like uh, formatting functions, things like that. So here I have my formats. With, you pass it a format string and the value that you're going to put it, put it on, your, on your format string. So uh, the case where you don't know anything about those arguments, uh, you just call it normally, right? But then uh, there could be other cases where you know the format string, but the argument of how you're going to put the integer value there is going to come at runtime. And there's also the case where you know both of them uh, at compile time. And you want to have like this uniform syntax for those, but uh, then take advantage of the knowledge there and optimize based on that. And that's something that uh, was introduced not that long ago in, the, in Phobos, the, the standard library with uh, the right formatted write FLN function, where now you have the possibility of um, passing the format string at uh, compile time. But then this was an intrusive change. We have, you have to actually go to your code base, change all of your mat format strings to be passed as uh, compile time argument. So you don't have the benefit of just, even though the knowledge is already there for the compiler, you can just say, please do take advantage of that knowledge. So you have to change all of the call sites and it's not very obvious how in general, uh, if you are using this in generic code, how you don't take advantage of this without creating a big mess. And notice that even now, even though you're taking advantage of knowing the format string at compile time, you're not taking advantage of knowing the other arguments at compile time. So you can't like actually know, uh, oh, I know the, compile t the format string and the arguments, let me just pre-compute the old string at compile time and then I don't have to actually do any work at runtime. So uh, it, it just kind of proves that uh, you really have to, as it currently is D, do a lot of work to take advantage of these properties and this is like not the, the best possible model. Let's skip these. Okay, so let's talk about what I think could be an alternative approach. But before that, let me just ask you. So, one way to look at it is like saying, that's just how D works, you're talking nonsense, you're talking like properties of templates and that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, so, just don't do anything. Another way, it's like, okay, I could see that there are some inconsistencies here and there, maybe those could be improved. And you go over each one of them, you try to make them a little bit more consistent, to work better with each other, but that's going to be a lot of work and it's very easy for different differences to leak out and become visible and you have to maintain all of this parallel infrastructure. Another possible idea would be to really build some kind of common building block, some kind of infrastructure where you can then build the more advanced features on top of. So that would be solution two and kind of what I'm talking about here. So, What's the type of this? Int, yeah. Pretty simple. What's the DMD output for this? <coughs> Compiler error, yeah. It's, it's like, uh, yeah, you can't modify constant expression x. So you have a type that says, well, this is an int, but you can't modify it. As easy as it goes. So what's the type of this? Int. What's the DMD output of this? Cannot assign to our value something like, oh, it doesn't really matter. It's cannot modify constant x. Uh, the other one is cannot modify constant expression x. This is one cannot modify constant x. I don't know why one focus on the expression, why one focus on the variable. Seems arbitrary difference. Uh, I would say the enum one is the one who should focus on expression. But uh, on the enum, the type of the variable is int. So one way of looking at it is like, well, you're giving me the properties of this variable and what it should do, what it, you can do with it, what you can't do with it, but the int doesn't encode the constants that you can't modify it. And also, it doesn't encode the compile timeness. So uh, there's this mismatch where the type system isn't really working for us. We have to keep this parallel notion of what we can do with types while in many places it would be much more convenient to just have those notions encoded as part of the type. So 
how do we add to that enum x uh, that uh, we, have, we want to have at the level of the type system some notion of compileness? Compile timeness. Well, we, we could uh, add some kind of compile time qualifier to the type to say this isn't just an int, this is a compile time int. So what kind of qualifier? What do you think of this proposal? Compile time int x. Is that like a great syntax or not? No, no come on, this is a great syntax. Mm. I, I'm sure Walter would love this. <coughs> what about comp time int? Mm. I don't know why you're complaining that much because this fits pretty well with indeed. It's like C++ has like the ampersand. We have ref. It's like it's more verbose, more explicit. We have immutable. Why don't you like comp comp time or compile time. It's like immutable. It's like a really long keyword. Uh, so I actually think this is pretty reasonable. But if you don't like it, I guess we could go for something a bit shorter, like for instance, like a, some kind of pound or something like that. It's like compile time in. So now you, you're going to read this every time you see like the, the pound, you're going to read it as compile time. So what's the type of X? It's a compile time int. So how do you, uh, declare that enum variable? Well, it's not really a compile time int because a compile time int would be something that would be modified. So then you'd need to uh, also include in the type some notion of constants, right? So um, probably be either a compile time constant int or a compile time immutable int, something like that. Um, immutable as the advantage is kind of long, long keywords. Uh, but uh, I think it's the one that generalizes better from the notion of int. <laughs> yeah, it's really an overloaded keyword. Static, 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 Wow. Okay. So now we can have things that you used to not be able to have. Like uh, you can now have model level ints that are mutable. So for instance, you could declare a container where oh, I'm going to gather the, the names of all the things I use. And then uh, you get, for instance, a compile time reference to something, which is like be like an alias, and you get the properties of that, and you mutate it. So you have all of these different approaches where we just broke these, the common, uh, these completely different worlds that you used to have between the EST and the compile time function execution. Uh, in terms of uh, compile time statements, how could this work? Well, uh, you could prefix them uh, with uh, the pound to make them be executed at compile time. So for instance, a static if would be a, a pound if condition. And uh, I'm not sure here, uh, perhaps also dynamically based on the time of the condition, if it's declared as a compile time condition or, or runtime, uh, it would have uh, different behavior. Then you need to worry about uh, the, the scopes introduced by the, the braces. So currently, uh, this is very contextual. If you have a static int, the braces aren't really, don't really include a new scope. Uh, you, there are several different approaches that uh, you could handle that. I'm going to skip over that. What about function templates? Well, uh, used to have all of these separate compile time parameters and the runtime parameters. You could integrate them. So it's like now we'd really have an uniform function calling syntax. And one of the advantages of that is that you can change their types and you don't have to shuffle around. So for instance, if B uh, transitions to a compile time B, you don't have to shuffle their order around. And now we are ready to answer what's the type of a template. It's not template, it's not void. It's as some of you were saying, it's a kind of compile time function, right? Something you do at compile time where you can uh, generate this code, return these values. And so the exact uh, type would depend on what arguments it receives and what it returns. So for instance, uh, it could be a compile time function that receives a compile time int and returns a compile time int. Then you have to answer how would this approach uh, be able to do things like declare struts. Uh, so the hard way to do it in the, the old way, uh, be where you have a template. The, I think the equivalent way here is that you have a uh, compile time function that receives a, 
a compile time uh, integer argument, and then you return uh, the type, the type itself. So you would need to have uh, first class types. A question here? either. Oh, here we go. We've got volume. Okay. Now, now it works. Um, that is something, the uh, parameterizing uh, compile time type does not work because then the is breaks. So the reason we have the hash tables for templates is because there are actually fundamental principles in the type system that do rely on the same template being instantiated with the same parameters, resulting in the same type, and we cannot break that. That, that the one that you have there right now, um, cannot work that way. You would have to wrap it in a template. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I think that there are a lot of challenges with this, so that's why this is very exploratory. And I'm aware of the, that uh, issue of. Um, things be, being able to uh, return different, with the same arguments, return different things. So that's like, if you have a non-pure compile time function, that could impact type equality. It's basically what we were saying, right? So that's an issue. I, I'm completely aware of that. But uh, I think there are solutions for that. Let me just speed up a little bit to uh, not take too much of the time. Uh, what about other compile time types? So. First class uh, types have types themselves. Uh, so where you'd have a compile time type uh, here, I guess the equivalent would be that you, you receive some T, which is itself of type type, except that type is a compile time type. And uh, that's here, perhaps in some cases, you'd want to integrate the notion of uh, uh, type of and runtime type information that has some pros and cons. Another issue is that how this would uh, work in terms of uh, type deduction, where you pass in the template parameters uh, the T, and then you deduce it based on the ca calling um, site. Uh, there are several possibilities for how this could work. For instance, uh, in Sparrow, uh, it has the any type, so this is kind of a wildcard. In, in Jai, uh, it has the dollar syntax, where the, you mark from which parameters you want to deduce it. There are different approaches, like for instance, you could receive uh, optional arguments uh, that you don't have to explicitly pass, and those could uh, interact with the other ones. But uh, depending on how you want to do that, then we might have to relax the, uh, the rules for passing uh, optional arguments in different parts of the calling uh, order. Another issue, of course, is that uh, if you start putting <coughs> compile time this and that, so certainly you have like compile time everywhere, so you're putting uh, these hashes everywhere, that gets old really, really fast. Uh, an issue where if you just want to do like CTFE type computation, you could just mark a function as, by, as being compile time, and you wouldn't have to like declare every argument and every variable and every statement as being compile time, and that would just get lowered by applying uh, the compile time notion to each one of those. And I think this part here also helps to answer what makes something uh, compile time executable, where uh, first you want to get a function that was just a regular function, you apply the compile time modifier to it, you uh, recursively apply the compile timeness to every uh, part of it, like every statement, and then do type checking on that and see if that is able to be compiled and run. And for calling uh, runtime functions, uh, doing that lowering, you'd use the, the pound syntax. I'm going to skip a little bit more. Um, so one advantage of this approach uh, is that uh, you could uh, get a lot of features that are currently separate features and just use uh, these compile time functions to do the same thing. So, why do we need to have a pragma message? You could just have some kind of uh, function that at compile time outputs a value. When we read files with this special import uh, statement, we could just have a compile time uh, function to read files from the file system with security concerns, of course. We don't, I don't think we really need to have all of these 
great syntax, not all of them, when you could just have a much more clear compile time API, where it just be just another API, except that the functions are compile time functions. And I see a lot of uses of uh, string mixins, where you create all of these uh, arbitrary code at uh, compile time, uh, that a lot of them I think would, could be a, a lot more clear if you just had a much more contained uh, API which did much more specific things, you didn't, wouldn't have too much flexibility. So here in this example, instead of manually doing uh, the parent dot the member, you could just call the compile time function get member from uh, a reference to the parent with the name of the member name, and it would do the same thing as that string mixin. Uh, I'm not sure where, um, I don't think there's any language that explores quite this region of the design space. So for instance, I borrowed some of the ideas from other languages and you can see that they try to address similar things, but they don't really go there to the, the same territory. So yeah, I know this was very speculative. I'm totally sure almost none of you were convinced by it, but I feel there's like this core of a potential there. So I think this is, could be further worked upon, massaged and maybe uh, even if it were not applied directly to D as it currently exists, some good ideas could be ported back. So I, I'm still playing with these, and uh, if you have, uh, like, I saw, like I saw before, some uh, good ideas that you can share with me, try to see if we can make some progress of these, uh, your feedback would be totally welcome. So thank you. Right, and it's uh, question time now. Uh, one thing I didn't see you mention that uh, hits me a lot of the time is uh, underscore underscore CTFE. Because sometimes I write a function, especially for mixins, that is only ever called at compile time. And then the compiler complains if I'm using a runtime parameter at compile time, saying, I can't read this at compile time. Yes, you can. I'm only calling it from CTFE. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you think about that. It's interesting. I'm not sure I actually did think about that, but uh, that does sound like something that you really want to have like a test case for that to see if the design solves that. So there are, I couldn't list it all, but I had this huge list of different, oh, and I want to make sure it works in this case. I want to make sure it works on that case. But they were just, it was such a laundry list of little issues that I couldn't really put them in the presentation. But I have a long list of that kinds of issues. So if you can share your concerns with me, maybe I could make the list better cover of the concerns. And yeah, so that's a like very, very valid point. Yeah, um, I think we in particular have a lot of the same uh, work that we did. For example, I wanted to do the same thing you did, but except I didn't use the hash. I did use the, I repurposed the alias keyword because that already expresses that something is a type or that something is only known at compile time. And we should definitely talk about this together. Thank you very much for bringing more attention to this. I'm very happy with this talk. Yeah, thanks. All right, are there any other questions here? Yeah, Manu. Um, I'd just like to share an anecdote that I had. Um, I recently did a hackathon in the office where one of my colleagues was exposed to D for the very first time. Um, going into D, he was very happy with it. He did a whole bunch of meta and complained bitterly for days about all of the things that you discussed in the start of his talk. And then his takeaway from D was, yeah, I kind of like D, except I wish it was pretty much the way that you've described. <laughs> Wow, but that's like the, the best compliment I could get on, on, on that. Yeah, that's, wow. Thank you for sharing that anecdote. All right, any more questions or anecdotes? No, oh, looks like we're done. Thank you again, Luis. Thank you. Thank you.